We're not fighting against people who had better arguments. There's no arguments here. We're not, this is not the, we're not in the field of rational humans. We're not rational. We're not rational. We teach, you know, Bitcoin, there's numbers everywhere. It has nothing to do with math. People say, oh, I love the math of Bitcoin. Yeah, it's great. It's what gives us assurance that it's true and it's the one data point. But truthfully, it is the psychology that it unleashes is our advantage, right? The, the confidence that we've got the system is what will inevitably bring us to a level of, of, of economic ability to win this fight. And that's what we have to do. It's an economic war and we've got to be richer than them. That's it. We need the Bitcoiners, the richest. And all the people who got in early, rich, but that's not really the prize. The prize is to decimate the job of Wall Street. It's to destroy the financial engineer. Greetings and salutations, my fellow plebs. My name is Walker, and this is the Bitcoin Podcast. The Bitcoin time chain is 839228, and the value of one Bitcoin is still one Bitcoin. Today's episode is Bitcoin Talk, where I talk with my guest about Bitcoin and whatever else comes up. Today, that guest is Nolan Bowerly, aka Count BTC. Nolan writes, produces, and creates content related to our shift from a fiat to a Bitcoin standard as a measure of economic production. He also has a long and fascinating history working in the Bitcoin industry from the early days. He hosts a daily show called The Breakup and just released two books which are available for free download. You can get them in the show notes. Bitcoiner's Guide to U.S. 2024 Elections and A Bitcoiner's Guide to NPC Management. We cover a lot of topics in this show, but one of the main things we discuss and keep coming back to is how to break through the delusions created by fiat and ultimately how everything, even chaos, is good for Bitcoin. Before we dive in, I'm pleased to announce a new partner for the Bitcoin podcast, Cloaked Wireless, a privacy and security focused 5G wireless service built by Bitcoiners for Bitcoiners. You can go to cloakedwireless.com and use the promo code Walker for 25% off eSIM or physical SIM plans for your first month. You can pay in fiat or in Bitcoin and keep yourself safe from SIM swap attacks. And of course, shout out to my longtime sponsor, Bitbox. Go to bitbox.swiss slash walker and use the promo code walker for 5% off the fully open source Bitcoin only Bitbox O2 hardware wallet. If you'd rather watch this show than listen, you can head to the show notes for links to watch on YouTube, Rumble, and now on Noster. But if you're like me and you just prefer to listen to your podcasts, I highly recommend you check out Fountain.fm. Not only can you send Bitcoin to your favorite podcasters to give value for value, but you can earn Bitcoin just for listening to this show. And if you're already listening to the Bitcoin podcast on Fountain, consider giving the show a boost or creating a clip of something you found interesting. And if you are a Bitcoin-only company interested in sponsoring another fucking Bitcoin podcast, hit me up on social media or through the website bitcoinpodcast.net. Without further ado, let's get into this Bitcoin talk with Nolan Bowerly. Oh, we love the Miller Lite. I didn't know we were doing Miller Lights. I, you know what? I'm a simple, I'm a simple, uh, you know, small town guy from it's Wisconsin. Like, so I, I can't help it uh, when it comes to Miller light. It's my, uh, it's my weakness and my strength. Um, <laughs> but yeah, figured it was uh, fitting. I just got done mining some Fiat. And so it's like, well, like any good American after getting done mining Fiat, you got to have yourself a little, a uh, little brisky, right? Yeah, man. Yeah, I, uh, I've been getting cheese where I live here from Wisconsin a lot. And as a Vermonter, it's kind of something I don't see around a lot, you know, but uh, Vermont, we've keep, got great we cheese high on our own supply. But yeah, my wife's been loving it. We got the cottage cheese. We got some cheddars that she's loved. The sour cream. I can't remember the brand, but boy, is it good. Yeah, it's uh, honestly, we uh, you got to love the the spirit of Wisconsin where we're like, you know what? Uh, let's see. We, we eat a lot of cheese here. What's a, what's a good, like kind of mascot for, well, how about a cheese head? It's just like yep, right on the nose, you know, like it may as well have been a beer belly, but it's like, oh, cheese head that, that works pretty well. Yeah. But dude, thank you for joining. Uh, you know, I want to, I want to start out by just for anyone who is not familiar with you, who is watching or listening to this, 
I like to start with just a very simple question. And that's just, who are you and how did you get where you are today? And you can take that any way you want. I'm, I'm a Bitcoiner. I'm a Bitcoiner. I think that's the easiest way to describe what I am. And I, I feel settled in that because I've been professionally operating in Bitcoin for 11 years now. So for 11 years, I've been paid and have been working off of this crazy ecosystem uh, that we started, this crazy revolution. So I came in with those that sort of political group of people that came in after the Occupy movement. At the time, I was working as a lawyer, um, not not a lawyer. I never passed a bar exam or anything like that, but I'd finished law school. I did a little bit of time in Japan at a law firm there, but I got a job afterwards in the Senate Banking Committee in Canada. And uh, we were looking into money laundering, like the whole FinCEN, FinTrack thing, and this would have been 2012. But we were sort of a proto-populist government at the time. And what we found out was that FATF, which if you don't know the, the sort of operating hub of FinCEN in America, FinTrack in Canada, um, they operate out of Paris. And what was happening was now ca Canadian federalism is almost an exact copy of American federalism, except one thing. It's banking. They made banking a federal charter event. States get to create these sort of quasi credit unions, they're called, and it's a completely different charter. And the corporate structure they're allowed to have is also very different. Now, the, the long and short of it, it involves Wisconsin and where you're from a little bit. It's basically after the Civil War, the British said, you know, they'd already had two wars against the United States. And they said, after they'd seen what happened in the Civil War, they said, these motherfuckers are too crazy. Like, we're not fighting this again. Canada, you idiots, you're on your own because we're not doing this. And so what that really meant was we couldn't get British London finance anymore to build infrastructure east-west. So basically the point was consolidate the purpose of banking into this federal architecture. So the committee that I worked for actually was kind of a, a real think tanky committee. It's the original parliamentary committee in Canada. It is literally there to build the railroad. That was the point of building the country. They had to build east-west because they knew the private railroads that were coming in after the Civil War were going to go north-south. And that was going to destroy any concept or purpose to have a Canada. It would just been commercially extracted from the United States. So they said, let's try this thing out. It was like the original plan B. Like if the America thing doesn't work out, at least we have this other experiment and we'll see how we it got goes. a plan going up in the end. Yeah, they, like, they completely yeah. fucked it up and they've made a country filled of the dumbest people in the world. I mean, they really are the stupidest people in the world now. And one of the reasons is the banking, right? They're, they're the most hypnotized by fiat because they've only got seven banks which is why they were able to do the truckers thing back in, in 2022, because it was literally, I mean, a group call could have handled it. There's so few banks. That's why you saw all the Canadian banks come in and swoop uh, in 2008 in America, because we were a little not interested in the credit default swap thing, a little conservative. They're making money anyway, so what do they care, right? So that's why in your area, I bet you see a lot of BMOs now, right? BMO came in. That's, that's a Canadian, oh, yeah. that's the Bank of Montreal, right? That's the Bank of Montreal. So they came in at that time and started, you know, you see TD a lot. That's where the Celtics play in Boston and the Boston Bruins will play there. That's the Toronto Dominion Bank. They all have these imperious names like the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, right? So they have all these names. There's not a lot of them, right? So they, what was happening though, to get back to the job, was that the credit unions, so the state chartered banks, can't consolidate the $10,000 reporting requirement, you know, the same, that, that's their whole plan, by the way, to stop money laundering is that thing you sign on the airplane, right? <laughs> Do you have $10,000? No. And then that's their plan. So, so in Canada, the credit unions, now there's a weird thing that goes along with this. It's just corporate structure. They're not able to um, corporatize to the head office compliance for what we call FinTrack in Canada, what you call FinCEN in the United States, the FATF umbrella. Mm -hmm. So w this was a political wedge issue for us because what was happening was small, rural, usually agricultural state chartered banks were saying, instead of a loan officer, we've got to hire another compliance officer because we can't use a head office compliance thing. So we didn't know anything about it other than Parisian morons telling country people what to do. And that's what we call a wedge issue in politics, right? So you're like, let's drive a wedge into that and make this into a big problem because, 
you know, we, we like the idea of some UN thing telling small town Canadians what to do and we're going to stop it. Right. So that was kind of the point. And what I ended up finding out in this investigation it was a year long study. This was in 2012. We almost were we were ready to destroy FinTrack root and stem at the time. We were, you know, we politically thought it was just terrible and they didn't do anything. They didn't catch criminals. I got both parties are liberal and conservative. So you're Democrat and uh, Republican to both agree they were useless because they could see there was nothing actually happening. Right. They were not prosecuting anyone. And, you know, liberals and Democrats would have a heartstring. And the way we pulled it was this, you know, the small town people getting ground to the ground by Canadian banks. So we had everybody on board. And I'm telling you, I was that close to destroying it. They had to do a private meeting where I wasn't allowed because I was whispering in every one of the senator's ears about this and that. And they knew it was a big problem. So I was banned by the lobbyists from entering in there. But it didn't matter because during that investigation, I'd already learned about Bitcoin. And that's all I was thinking about. That's it. Like some someone laughed in a, in a testimony, like, wait, do you see this next thing? And I was like, what's the next thing? Like, what are you talking about? You know? And so in 2013, I got them to do a, a study on, on Bitcoin. Uh, we brought Andreas Antonopoulos to testify. It was a huge, huge hit. You know, people watched it all around the world. We didn't, we didn't try to approach it as you know, what about the criminality? We, we, we have ignored that. We were like, other people have done that. What about, what, what are we really dealing with here? And is it as big as it could, you know, it possibly hints at? And so I got sort of permission from our prime minister in Canada at the time, uh, Pierre Polliver, who I think is running for leadership, is, was also around at the time and saying, well, maybe, maybe, you know, might as well look at the benefits of separating money and state. It was those gang, it was that gang in charge of the country at the time. Uh, and weirdly, the the prime minister at the time, his son, who I knew when he was a little boy, is now a, a derivatives trader with Luxor. He's a complete and total uh, maximalist. He's hilarious. He's like 25 years old or something. And I remember he was a kid. I was like throwing the football on his lawn, you know? So there you go. These people have all sort of come to it. Now, what happened was at the time, I was pretty sure Justin Trudeau was going to scam his way into being the prime minister. So I said, we finished the study. Um, I did a cool publicity trick where I used the op return script to hash the report into Bitcoin's blockchain simultaneous to our publishing of the report. And so it's in there. It's Satoshi's invention deserves a light regulatory touch block 36,000 something something from back in 2015. And uh, weirdly, I had the original co-working space where Ethereum was created. They helped engage this for me. So that, that's a whole another story. I was living in Toronto at this time and I would travel back and forth between Ottawa where our capital was. And I used to do rideshare for people, right? I had a car and I would get 30 bucks or whatever. And, you know, because I didn't get, no one was paying for my travel. It was all sort of on my own. And this would have been early 2014. And I saw a Bitcoin sign outside of a store where I was meeting people to get on the highway and go. And I said, what's, I thought I was the only human who knew about Bitcoin around here. And I walked in and there was Vitalik. He had just started Bitcoin magazine or he had started it two years ago and was writing articles. Ethereum was just about to come out. Uh, it was about a year and a bit before the actual network launch, but he was just doing Bitcoin magazine articles at the time and talking about this other thing. And everyone was just kind of there. And so I chatted with everyone. And when I finally released the report a year later, um, I quit my job. Obviously, they were I was going to start like retirement or something stupid after. And I was like, no, 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 I'm good. I'm, it's Bitcoin forever. So um, this was the time. So I went and worked at that co-working space for a little while and uh it was the original atm of toronto so that's where all the drug dealers silk road folks were getting their you know we we, we didn't care what people were doing back then obviously right it sold the, the machine sold bitcoin and that was it and uh you could buy and sell it there was a big lineup to sell it and we did our business and and it funded the whole business and it was great uh but at the same time Coindesk in America was in, now this was the, the bear market 2014 and 2015 are still, I think, they were as bad as the bear that we just went through. They were, they were, you could see the bottom. You could see like if a few things went a little wrong and sketchy, it might have all been over, right? So we were pretty low down there. And, and what happened was Coindesk was finished, basically. They couldn't keep paying the bills. Um, so DCG acquired them. But they were actually started, Coindesk was started in London. 
And when Barry bought it, he said, forget it. It's it's not going to be in London anymore. It's got to be in New York. So I joined the original team that was put together in early 2016 that ended up building the American version of Coindesk that you would have seen for years. <clears throat> so I ended up sort of falling into events, uh, which was a pretty neat little niche. I think I created the Wall Street version. You can you can blame me for that. Uh, all this Wall Street shit. Basically, I knew Andreas had the market cornered on everybody and that there was a niche little market of education evangelist stuff in Wall Street. So that ended up being what I did. So I ended up going on all the fake news shows, CNN. Whoa, is there a hack? The price is up. The price is down. Oh, it's the same story every day. But it was fun because you got the black car service and they drove you and you do the TV shows and this and that. So that was all good. Um, but, you know, as you go on and and as Coindesk grew as a company and, and I did the show and it would have been right after the 2017 uh, Thanksgiving weekend, if you remember, everyone was going crazy about Bitcoin that weekend. We had our show. We just hit the nail on the head. It was the first day Bitcoin hit $10,000 live on our stage uh and i still i'll never forget the headline it's like waking up and doing it because the show is literally on broadway right so the show was on broadway and it was the original show where before that before 2017 if you'd say i'm doing a, a bitcoin show someone on wall street would say i'm not an engineer i'm not a tech guy i was the first person who said to them no 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 no, no. we don't care you know if you understand hash rate as a key price indicator you're good to go we want to we want to do a show in wall street vocabulary we don't want to meet them halfway. We want to go to where they are and try to break this down in language they understand without getting into the complicated aspects of cryptography and engineering and crypto economics. And we don't need any of that. We just need the nuts and bolts. What does this mean for Wall Street? Let's go. And so we programmed a show and it was so successful. You couldn't get in. It was a big thing. And I'll never forget the headline. CNBC has a headline. It's uh, Bitcoin crosses $10,000 packed conference parties into the night. I mean, you can't beat that kind of a headline. It's just not possible. You know what I mean? You, you wake up and you have a hit Broadway show like that. It's pretty much the greatest feeling in the world, you know? So we did pretty well. But of course, as you imagine, Coindesk has other priorities and uh, that's all fine. I, I never had a problem with their other priorities. I was in a lane. It was going great. Um, but I had the opportunity in 2019 to, to exit, you know, uh, in a, in a beneficial way, let's say I still stayed on as advisor, but now I could start focusing on things that I wanted to focus on more, which was Bitcoin only and, and Bitcoin related things, you know, because of course, Bitcoin provides a sort of worldview versus crypto, which I don't mind. I'm not an anti crypto person, but it's baseball cards. It's, it's, it's Pokemon, right? It literally is the same Pokemon people will say, you know, Bitcoin is Pokemon, but in the case of crypto, I believe it is. And there's nothing wrong with that. Pokemon's great, right? You, I don't have a love me some Pokemon. Pokemon. Yeah, I love me yeah. some Pokemon, yeah. <laughs> got to catch them but all, man. <laughs> you got to catch them all. But Bitcoin, of course, is is something else entirely. It's, it's, it's the basis of a worldview. It's something as an event programmer, which is what I do now with Bitcoin Magazine. I program the Bitcoin Magazine events. Um, the canvas is everything under the sun. Right. It's not just the the areas of cryptography or computer science or scaling. That's all interesting. I still program that stuff. It was the blind spot I had going into this uh, in those early years that I described earlier was cryptography. So I devoted myself to being a student of cryptography for several years. So I'm still you kind of had to do that back in those days. If you wanted to enter the industry, you really had to have uh, chops, let's say, in just cryptography outside of Bitcoin, you had to know what hashing really was. You had to understand those things. So, you know, asymptotal graphs and you just had to have an understanding of what was going on behind, um, behind just the, the markets and all that stuff. So you had to have an understanding of the cryptography. So I spent, you know, a good two years. I'm not, I couldn't teach the stuff. I'm not even at that level, but I'm capable of understanding what someone's talking about and referencing and things like that. So, um, when you go into these Bitcoin only events, of course, you start being able to get into political things, psychological things. Uh, you can start programming lifestyle. You know, you can start programming what Bitcoin has taught us about diet and health. And so you start being able to use contrast a lot more to describe fiat and Bitcoin. And that's how you're able to drive down to that 
worldview level. So that's what I'm interested in doing and why, you know, that's my sort of Bitcoin only path. Um, it's not against anything else. It's it's just literally Bitcoin is so much more interesting and so much more relevant. Um, and there's so much more to talk about and plan. You know, I, I saw this last year when at our event, people I even programmed, Udi and Eric Wall going on, you know, all the other crypto shows are solving the world's problem. You guys are doing nothing. And I'm like, wait a minute. We're dispelling fake news about global warming. We're showing that everyone who relies on fiat information information sources are NPCs. They're the stupidest people in the world, including Ethereum and crypto bros and all that other stuff. They, you can lump them all into that NPC crowd. So, you know, the the ability to to see that contrast um, is what attracted me to to programming these Bitcoin events. And then I do a daily show called The Breakup. And we do The Breakup every every morning, which is exactly that, right? It's it's a, a method of contrasting fiat fake news and the fears and wants that it's desired to induce with uh, the Bitcoin incentive model. And you don't have to do anything more than that. Just put contrast there. You don't have to explain it to people. You don't have to say why Bitcoin's better, you know, <laughs> like I'm... None of that, right? I basically start every show with a segment I call Moscow time, because of course the fiat world is so ridiculous and absurd. You can't actually tell the difference between reality and humor. They've blended. They're the same thing. And so I just read headlines from the fake news and I don't add any context. I don't add anything else other than, you know, uh, exercising too much and eating steak will kill you and <laughs> don't go out in the sun and why inflation is a good thing. I mean, that one's been that one. I get to I get to get that headline at least once a month. Why inflation is really great, you know. And 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 why inflation when it's bad is your fault. Uh, oh, those are the best. You know, the, I love that, the your like, fault ones. The, your fault is awesome. It's unreal, though, and I I appreciate the the background because I always find that to be just it's fascinating because Bitcoiners are such a truly, and I mean this in the genuine sense of the word diverse group of humans from all walks of life from all over the world all different backgrounds it is not a uh fake fiat diversity of we'll put the right number of tokens you know token representations here and here and here and now we have look we did a diversity no it's the diversity that comes from something emergent and something that allows people to freely opt in versus being prescribed and I think that's beautiful. So I'm always curious about people's backgrounds and how they wound up where they are today. And I find that with Bitcoiners, the story is always fascinating and has, you know, now I know who to blame for, you know, Wall Street, Bitcoin. Uh, like, so if you're listening, you know, you son of a bitch, yeah, how, how could you? No, but, you know, did great. Bitcoin, we did great. Bitcoin is for anyone, right? Uh, maybe not for everyone, but for anyone. I, and I want to I want to poke at a couple of things because. I love your perspective doing uh, doing the breakup because I think it's, it, again, it's not telling people what to think. It is giving them things to think about and allowing them to draw their own conclusions, which often are self-evident if you have a few extra brain cells to rub together. Not everyone does, apparently. But you're working on a, a new book now, and you, you've put out a couple of, of books in the past. But I wonder if we can talk about that a little, because I just listened to the the audio version that you had put together, and it's a, the Bitcoiner's Guide for the 2024 election, right? And I, I, I loved your framing of it, and specifically talking about mimetic warfare and super prompting, and this, uh, uh, what, what did you say, um, uh, in, was it engage and amplify, or? Uh, engage and amplify, what, yeah, that's a good yeah, one. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay. I, I, I love that. And I love that framing of a way to engage. Can you talk about that a little bit and kind of sure. how you, yeah. what, what brought you around to pursuing that perspective? Well, remember you said earlier about the Wall Street people and, and their Bitcoiners too. And, and it's sort of what I'm thinking about these days. I guess you can say it this way. The people who came to Bitcoin early, um, the people who, who, who arrived at where you arrived, where I arrived, it's not necessarily an IQ or an information problem. It could be something you noticed that was wrong in the world. So it's not necessarily a test of intelligence, right? It's not necessarily that. 
Um, I know a lot of dumb Bitcoiners. That's fine. I love the low IQ, 80 IQ plebs, right? But let's be honest. The people who can rub two cells together are already there. They already learn. They already know what's going on, right? So that's why a lot of Bitcoin outreach or orange pilling, I guess it's called, seems to think that it's like an information problem. Like, like they just didn't hear about it. So you get a lot of nagging, like, you just got to know about central banks. No one wants to fucking know about central banks. We've made people, fiat has spellbound them to such an extent that the black magic of it leaves them absolutely, they don't even want to hear it. I mean, they're allergic to the news, right? So we're not dealing with an information problem. We're not dealing with an IQ problem. That's generally how it's been approached until now. At this stage, now, there are people who are about to come, like the Wall Street folks. They have the best educators in the world sell these ETFs. I mean, salesmen are also educators. So they now have an army of people, and they're going to make it. I mean, they're, they're going to make it. They have the high IQ, the energy people, right? They're not, they're not, they're not um, hypnotized by fiat climate science fears, so they're fine. They're going to make it, right? They're, they're a big part of it. But this idea that the Bitcoin revolution runs through every pleb who somehow was orange pilled is a kind of a dead end street, right? We, we, there are people that just aren't smart enough. That's the problem, right? It's not, it's not an IQ problem. It is that they've been spellbound and hypnotized and they are under delusions. And so how do you break through the delusions? Arguments don't work. You, you can show me, you can show me any statistic you want on COVID in any direction. And I'll think you're an idiot. If you're going to convince me in 2024 with data, fucking data, all the data is shit. There is no data about anything except one data point in the world, which is the Bitcoin blockchain. It is literally the only useful data left because the incentives have hollowed out every other incentive structure out there that would allow us to have any confidence in the data. Everyone's making money and you can't tell how, so you can't trust the data. It might be right. I don't know if it's right. It's not trustworthy. It's not credible, right? So super prompting really works to, instead of an argument, what you do is you basically punch someone in the face argumentatively or or in a context, right? Like, I love stupid presidents. I voted for Joe Biden five times, right? Now, I love Donald Trump and I've loved Donald Trump since 2015, right? But genuinely, as a Bitcoiner, when I stop and look at 2020, the best case scenario for us was a stolen election and a mentally ill and dementia head president. I mean, it's the best possible outcome. Because what you get is the true sense now that we don't, that's not the leader of the free world. We haven't had civilian control of the U.S. military in 50 years. I mean, it's a joke, right? So can you explain that to someone or can you get them to understand it themselves? When you super prompt, when I say to someone, no, no, I voted for Joe Biden five times. They say, what? And I say, yeah, yeah, he's the best, you know, but, but, oh, you think I want him to do the job? No, I'm a Bitcoin. I don't give a fuck. What are you talking about? Let it burn. Fuck. It's hilarious. Joe Biden's the president. Yeehaw. Woo. So if you play that game, it's just like elections, right? It's like elections. Like everyone is pessimistic about what's going on in America, but it's a good thing. All elections in all 50 states work great. Nothing else works. I can't go buy an iPhone at a cell phone store. I can't do that. You can't. Have you tried to buy a phone in America at a phone store? It's, it is a circus of incompetency, of stupid bureaucracy. I mean, I, I've laughed about this and then people have, they think I'm joking. And then they go to buy a phone. You can't. Go to the Apple store and buy a phone. Find out what happens. They're, they don't know how to complete the transaction. They don't know where the phones are. They don't know any of this stuff. <laughs> They're just incompetent, right? And Apple stores are the best, right? Go to Best Buy and go and buy a phone there. You can't. You just can't do it. So the point is, you're not going to be able to convince people through arguing that this works. You've got to really treat them like the NPCs they are, right? It's not an information problem. It's a frame problem. And these are high IQ people. What they need is the spell, the fiat dark magic to be broken. My other book, The Bitcoiner's Guide to NPC Management, is explicitly about this. It's explicitly about uh, removing the scales from their eyes and prompting them into this engaged situation where they're sort of figuring it out for themselves, right? Because that's what you got to do. Now, when you have the cognitive dissonance that, it, that super prompts are designed to create, that's the embrace and amplify piece, right? For example, another one that Bitcoiners should embrace. I don't know why they don't, right? I hear people saying UBI is so dumb. 
oh, UBI, we can't do that. We can't print more money. Yes, we fucking can. Print it. Let's go. Give it to all the fat people. I don't want to fat shame, but give it to them. Accelerate. Give, them. give them the money. <laughs> Accelerate, right? If someone wants to sign up for a CBDC, I, why should I stop them? It's none of my business. I mean, if they want to live like that, I used to believe we could all make it. Then COVID came and I'm sure we can't. Now, we're in a middle state in the same way that, and this is the UBI sort of argument for Bitcoiners, right? You look at El Salvador. El Salvador is experiencing what we call bimetallism. Bimetallism was what we had in America before the Federal Reserve was created. It was silver on gold. We're going to see the Wizard of Oz come out again in 2024. They've remade Wizard of Oz. It's obviously going to be shit. But the original, not the movie, the original book, it wasn't ruby red slippers. It was silver slippers on gold, on a gold road. And the point of this is the book came out in the 1890s and was about the fight before the banking cartel was created in 1912. And DC is uh, the Emerald City. The bankers are the witches. They send the people out to get stuff. It's a quid pro quo. You do something from you, give me the power of the bankers, which is what happened. Populism came with the silver and created such a, a ruckus in the market that there was a demand for centralized, um, a central bank and lender of last resort from then on. So, um, you know, you take that that bi bimetallism point of view and you say, well, if we're not if we're going back to the gold standard, we might have to go to it the way we came to it, which was this period of first bimetallism before we arrived at, at pure fiat. And so if, if we turn the polarity back, maybe in 80 years, we can have only sound money in the world, right? Maybe when we really just crush fiat into the ground and it's nothing but bone dust. Yeah, maybe, right? Um, but first and foremost, we can create this division where we explicitly make political money what it should be, food stamps. And it should be. We should have fiat, actual policy money, really political money for people who need it. And I think that's an easier way because, like, look, as Bitcoiners, we don't – the fiat sludge people are going to need help. Like we can't have this appetite where everybody dies and like it's a Bitcoin Mad Max world. Like my version of a world on Bitcoin has enough empathy and compassion that every every person who needs help. I mean, the point of Bitcoin is to start being more efficient with our capital and understanding that we can actually take care of everyone. This isn't survival of the fittest. This isn't Darwinian. We're 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 the opposite of Darwinian and that whole thing that came in with Darwinian evolution and survival of the fittest and blah, blah, blah. I don't buy it for a minute, right? I don't buy it. I don't buy that humans are like that. We're not an animal. We can make the weakest amongst us capable of enjoying their lives. And I think that's something all Bitcoiners should aspire to. And if we have to do it with some money printing for now while we wind down this thing, so be it. Other people can already move to Bitcoin and protect their wealth and preserve their ability to save and and you know, getting it back to the low IQ job that saving money used to be, right? It used to be I good at a thing and I save my money, right? And if yep. you save your money in 2024, you're an idiot. You're the dumbest person I know. Right? You're fucked. You're like fucked. You, you, you are really fucked. Well, and yeah. I think that's such a, uh, an important point that is lost to so many that are completely brainwashed in the fiat world. We've been taught that somehow uh, in order, you know, when you make money, you can't just sit on that money. You have to invest that money and make your money work for you. And, you know, by, by buying real estate, by buying stocks, by being really, really super smart, or, or if you're not super smart, trusting somebody to handle your money for you and, and make sure you put all, everything you can into a 401k, because then you'll be set for retirement, even though that, you know, the returns that 401k is making are probably not even keeping up with inflation. Like it's tracking the most mediocre basket of goods that it possibly can when it comes to, uh, when it comes to stocks and the idea that, you know, you should be able to work hard to be a productive member of society, to bring value to the market and have the market say, yep, what they're doing is valuable. They should be paid for it. And then to take the fruits of your labor and save them without needing to go through a bunch of fucking financial gymnastics just to be able to tread water because the purchasing power of your wealth is being inflated away by a bunch of people who think, 
well, why are you complaining? The economy's fine. We just got the recent cooked book numbers and everything looks hunky dory. No, you should be able to work hard at something and to not have to jump through hoops to save the value of your energy and of your expended time across the space of time. And that it, it used to be the case. And you can very much see that in the standard of livings around the world. But, I, you know, as an American, I'll, I'll speak about America. Like, you know, my, my grandfather uh, was a minister, did not make a lot of money. You know, obviously he was a minister, but saved and was frugal and was able to, you know, retire and provide a great life for my grandmother long after he passed away for decades after he passed away, on a minister's salary. This was also, if you worked in manufacturing, I did some time at, at, uh, at General Electric Appliances um, in a past fiat life. Uh, and, and when I was working there, I was listening to stories of people who had been there. Uh, I was managing people on the, sem on the assembly line who had been at that job longer than I'd been alive at that point. They'd been there for 35 years. I mean, it was but it was incredible to hear their stories about back in the day, you know, wow. And these people still made good money, especially if they'd been there for that many years because they just, their rates kept going up. Like they actually did fairly well, all things considered, but what they made just didn't go as far anymore. And they were all able to buy really nice houses and have a single parent working while the mom stayed at home and provide a really wonderful life for their families working a job and saving their money. And they weren't brilliant stock investors. They just worked hard. They did something that was valuable and needed, making appliances and provided a wonderful life and a comfortable life for their family. You cannot do that anymore. We're at a place where you need to have both parents working just to tread water. And if you want to get ahead a little, maybe you need a second job. You know, one of you needs a second job, but oh, because you're both working also, you've got to pay for daycare. And so, and that's, you know, only getting more expensive, right? And so people are stuck in this just hamster wheel cycle. And again, this is the, a lot of them perhaps through no fault of their own per se, you know, uh, everyone's eyes are closed until, until they're open. Right. And it's very easy for us who have our eyes open to look and say, well, why don't you see it yet? But you don't see it until you see it. It sounds, you know, cliche, but it's true. And so we have to have some compassion for these people, but sometimes to bring them around to it, uh, the approach that you're suggesting with kind of punching them in the face with this absurdist argument, almost satirical argument, I think is a very, a very good way to go about it. Cause it makes them just, even if it makes them just stop for a second and say, hold the fuck on. Wait, that doesn't make any sense. And then they realize what you're saying is what's said in all seriousness by them and their friends and the politicians they like. And then they say, hold on. Well, that's kind of ridiculous now that you put it that way. It's those little clicks. If you're saving in Bitcoin like me, so you're not forced to financially tread water until you die in this broken fiat system, you need to keep that Bitcoin safe for the long haul. Head to bitbox.swiss slash walker and use the promo code walker for 5% off the fully open source Bitcoin only Bitbox O2 hardware wallet. Then get your Bitcoin off the exchange, preferably before the halving, and into your own self-custody. The BitBox O2 is easy as hell to use, whether you're new to Bitcoin or a seasoned psychopath. Again, it's Bitcoin only, and it's fully open source. You can head to their GitHub and verify for yourself. Please do not feel the need to trust me. And when you go to bitbox.swiss slash walker and use promo code walker, not only do you get 5% off, but you also help support this fucking podcast. So thank you. Yeah. And that's, that's, that, that's the psychology. That's why psychology and arguments and information are not exactly the same thing, right? <clears throat> you know, with money as debt, the way it is, like you said, it's not their fault. It, it is a form of black magic. It's a form of hypnosis. If you can define by controlling the money, what people are afraid of, because, of course, what propagates the fiat network is the fake news, right? If the fake news wasn't in the bag and the aircraft carriers weren't in the bag, none of it would propagate, right? So you got the aircraft carriers, but most importantly, right, fiat tells you exactly what it is. It's, it's dictate. It's dictate. It's, it's dictates from the government, and that's money.
And what that ended up doing, as far as I can tell, not only defining the fears and wants, which is how to simulate reality. I mean, you can literally define reality to people if you make them afraid and 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 covetous of things and wanting things. You you can you have root key access, right? And that's why I constantly compare the psychological engines behind fiat and the outcomes it produced. You can understand the purpose of a machine by what it produces. And Bitcoin incentives seem to create these situations where, indeed, again, you can have a basic job and you're good at it. But now, because we've lowered the threshold to participate in saving, you can be focusing on the job and not saving. And indeed, I mean, that, that that's really the main difference I see with the crypto people that I've seen from the beginning. I was lucky enough to be able to perceive this from the very beginning. I, I had these arguments in 2014 with the people that I was with who were creating Ethereum. And what I would say to them, I'd say, okay, what I'm not understanding here, guys, right? What I don't really get, like, I don't get what you're trying to do. Now, what I want is a world where we get into the root key axis of people's brains and we change their time preference and then we make saving easy. We, we, what we don't want, the last thing we want is the best and brightest who will always go into the highest paid jobs. That, that's reality, right? The best and brightest that you can't stop the, the natural progression of those people, the natural attraction they'll have to the highest paid jobs. It's, it's just reality, right? Bitcoin accepts reality as it is. So if we had a whole generation where financial engineering was the best job, when these crypto people try and tell me that, you know, we, no, 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 it, it's not enough financial engineering. You got to get a Series 7 license. You got to know everything about all of the market manipulations in Wall Street, but you got to run an EVM fucking node and you got to do the flash bots uh, you know, minor extracted value, the MEV, and you gotta, you gotta be a computer scientist on top of it. So it's not gonna be good enough that you have a series seven license on wall street. It's not going to be good enough that you'd experience at a prop shop in Chicago. No, 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 no. We're going to add to this esoteric crypto knowledge that's all made up and mostly just complexity theater. And you got to memorize the complexity theater because, because, right? So again, that's the contrast. Fiat is and crypto have that in common, right? They they think that if you just put the best and brightest into one location, they'll fix everything. That's a very top-down way to see things, right? Now, with Bitcoin, all we're really doing is lowering the threshold to participate in the economy effectively. That's it. There's, there's nothing more complicated than that. But that's all we need. I mean, that's literally all we need now because we're feeling the effects of what we did. And it's a disaster out there. It's just a disaster. We can tell psychologically the trouble people are having has nothing to do with smartphones. Well, it does in a sense because it's given people that dopamine addiction, the outrage addiction, but that was already all fueled by the low time preference of money being debt and credit issued by the government. That's what's got this root key access and created these actual NPCs, these actual black magic hypnotized zombies. And so I don't know any other way. And I've seen it work, right? If you, if you, you know, you got, you got to think about what Trump does. Now, Trump goes a little far in that he creates mental illness, right? He's already dealing with mentally ill and mentally handicapped people. And that, that is his weakness in a sense, right? It's also his number one strength. The things he says, the way he says them, it lights people's brains on fire. And I mean, it absolutely lights their brains on fire. But that's the type of cognitive dissonance. Not, not everyone's going to like it when they have these thoughts that say, well, wait a minute, my whole worldview is wrong, right? Yeah. So th that's the issue here. Now, Trump has his way of doing it. You know, I, I continue to predict, I know there was a fake news story that said Vivek uh, won't be his vice president. I think he will be. I think it's pretty much in the bag. He, uh, he does everything. It'd be stupid of him not to, very stupid. honestly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Be... very stupid of him. Yeah. Very stupid. So... You know uh, oh, go ahead, I go just ahead. see the tension there. I just, I just see the, the, the complete package there because I don't find my, as someone who just said, I was a Trump 2015 all the way, never doubted except for Billy Bush Sunday that he was going to lose Billy Bush Sunday. Ah, party's over, you know, <laughs> but then he came back and he brought the crazy people that Clinton had raped or something to the fucking debate. Like just madness, right? Absolute hilarious madness. And he's a and, showman. And he, Whatever, yes, whatever, whatever you think of Trump, because I, 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 I think that Trump is also he personifies so many of the negative aspects of fiat in many ways. Now, I'm 
I, I don't think that Trump is is the devil like mm-hmm. many mm-hmm. people do. Um, I don't think Joe Biden's the devil either. I think they're both just human beings yeah. uh, with different levels of cognitive ability, different levels of ego, narcissism, and mm-hmm. capability. And I what I struggle with is, and this is something I say ad nauseum to the point where uh, Carla is like, oh, you got to stop saying that so much. But there is no red, there is no blue, there is the state, and there is you. And now, of course, and uh, Mark Moss rightly called me on this the other day saying, well, you know, you can't entirely say that across the board because obviously we do see at a more decentralized level, at a state level, we do see very big differences between red states and blue states, right? In terms of, for instance, during COVID, what states people were leaving and what states they were flocking to, undeniably. But when I say this, I mean it from the top level perspective of that presidential seat, because so much time and attention is spent focusing on that president. And rightly so, it's supposed to be the leader of the free world. But when do we see truly meaningful differences president to president? Like Trump printed ungodly amounts of money after, you know, and appointed Jerome Powell. Biden has printed ungodly amounts of money and also kept Jerome Powell in office. Uh, I mean, M2 I actually shrank slightly, hostage, you know, by the way. I describe uh, him as a hostage. Poor, poor guy. Uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> like blink, blink twice if you need to get out. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Every time I hear him talk, it's because he, he's got one where they asked him about the bricks and the dollar and he says, yeah, yeah, yeah. As long as America remains a rules based country, we have nothing to worry about. Yeah. yeah. It's like S yeah. blink Morse code SOS blinks. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. I, I actually, I want to, I want to go back onto one thing you said earlier, because I think it's really important as you were differentiating, uh, let's say a Bitcoiner mindset versus a fiat NPC or crypt, crypto mindset. And that is in terms of, I think what you were getting toward is the hubris of the fiat mind and the crypto in quotes, crypto mind, when it comes to, oh, if we just get enough of the smartest people in a room together, we can just tell the economy what it should do. We can just dictate how much money, you know, should be printed. We can just dictate what the interest rates are. We can dictate the amount of new money that's in circulation. We can dictate the, you know, the new tokens that we issue in the crypto sense. But to go to the fiat sense, it's this idea that, well, you know, the poor people, they don't know any better. So it's up to us, the anointed in our, in our back rooms to make these decisions for them. And if we just engineer the economy just right, everything will be perfect. We'll, we'll figure it out. And oh, sure. It literally, we've never been able to do that ever, but maybe this time, you know, just one more boom and bust cycle, one more boom and bust, and we'll get it right. Whereas the Bitcoiner mentality is just back the fuck away. You as, you as a singular individual or you as a group of people are never going to be smarter than the 8 billion plus people who make up the free market, the, the market that should be free. You cannot have all of the information that 8 billion people making independent decisions, judging value subjectively in their own best interest are going to make. And by trying to engineer it, you just lead to what we see, which is repeated boom and bust cycles, run up, run down, run up, run down. And it's not the people who are making these decisions who ultimately get hurt. And we certainly know they don't go to jail. We saw that after 2008, right? It's the people who are working at a factory job, who are, who are working at any sort of job that does not place them in close proximity to the money printer. They're the ones who get hurt just for trying to do something well, to provide value, and to make a decent life for their family. And they're repeatedly screwed because we have a bunch of fucking bureaucrats who think they know better than the free market. And that's that distinction that I think you were, you were getting at there. And it's, yeah. it's frustrating too, to see, cause it's just hubris. It's just hubris on their part. Which is one of the reasons why people like me in the same way that I joked about voting for Biden five times, it's the same reason why in 2015 and 2016, I loved Trump. The job of president needed to be changed. And if it became this TV celebrity fiat guy, it didn't matter. It was taking it out of the frame that it had been for so long. And Obama would be the great 
example of that, like all these weighted speeches, Harvard, teleprompters, be careful what you say, but why do we have to care about the president to that extent? I mean, it's a made up job. It has been practiced based on the times and customs of the era. The problem is we just inherited a World War II president and then we had the Cold War after and we never changed the job description. We just kept running them the same way. What they said on the news mattered and how what, you know, the news covered what they said. And so the whole thing really from that time was what my original um, um, backing of Trump was. It wasn't because I thought he was going to be like, you know, inspire everyone to come together and like, <laughs> have great policies, even though he was a successful and I, I predicted he would be successful in whatever he did. He did some good stuff and some bad stuff. I wasn't in it for the policies. I was in it for the shock already then as a Bitcoiner, I was already thinking strategically in the sense that how are we going to run this revolution? It, it can't be with a competent president. We don't want that. We want chaos. We literally want everyone to be arguing because it's a time of change. And Trump was change in the same reason why I embraced Joe Biden in 2020. It wasn't the mean tweets. It was the corruption. I wanted the corruption. The corruption was an even better way to push the job along. Like when, when Trump was there, you'd still be afraid of the president. What can they do? And da, 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 da. The president of the USA Inc. and the completely made up federal government that we don't even need and that has to be liquidated and shrunk and turned into exactly what Vivek is talking about, Moto Sierra, the Millet plan, right? It's got to be the Texas Moto Sierra massacre. They've got to just go and zzz, zzz, get rid of all these people. And, and, but we're seeing it already. And I, I think, I think Texas is going to be a, a real great example, right? If, if whatever way things go in the 2024 elections, it doesn't matter. Biden, Trump, Kennedy, we don't know. It doesn't matter. Texas has already assumed its sovereignty of the border. It's never giving that up. It's never going to create a confusing situation where the federal government and the Texan men are going to be uh, staring each other down. No, all men who understand violence know that they're not even going to put them in that position. It's never happening. Texas owns its border forever. They're never getting rid of that, ever. And if you look deep into Texas, right, if you look deep into what Texas actually is, it's a little bit similar to my home state of Vermont. In that the, you know, you had the original 13 colonies and then you had Wisconsin, which came part, as part of the territorial expansion you know, formula. But Texas and Vermont joined the Union as nations. They joined it as countries, actual countries. And that was the way America was originally started. Before the Civil War, you would have said the United States are. After the Civil War, you'd have said the United States is. After World War II, you started saying the Fed is or the government is, <laughs> right? The, so... So we're going to switch that here in this World War III, right, which is really just a continuation of World War I and World War II, which are really just wars about how to finance war, right? That, that's all it was. And we haven't stopped that war. We have not stopped it. We haven't stopped the, the job of president, as I said, is still this commander of the military industrial complex, which was set up for whatever reason to win World War II the way it was done. And we never shut off the aircraft carriers. We never shut off any of it. We just kept it all running. And so the point of the country, the business of the country is war. It is. And, and so that's what makes these new presidents that are incompetent or different or not beholden to the old ways or, you know, whatever Trump is. Interesting for Bitcoiners because we're it's showing that the actual republic is changing and that it's organic. Go back to Texas for a second. I'll, I'll finish the thought on that. When the border situation happened, you know, because Texas is a country, they still have the ability to mint their own non-fiat money that can't be fractionally reserved lent. They have a constitutional right amongst in their own sovereign sovereignty to issue money. Now they say it's got to be gold backed and and you know some form of collateralized money. I don't think it's limiting in the sense that they can't take their energy uh, system and do something like a volcano bond which is a mix of Bitcoin and their actual energy reserves. And they can issue that because they're not going to want to absorb the USA Inc.'s disastrous uh, Fed Reserve balance sheet that's about to become, you know, more toxic than ever. So Texas here has this ability, and, and so do all of the United States. There's nothing we need to change about the Constitution. There's no divorce coming. The point, you don't need divorce when everyone is sovereign and the nations are all sovereign. The, the states are sovereign. All we need psychologically is to change our point of view and start saying the United States are again, 
And that, that's where Bitcoiners are going to come in. Bitcoiners have a decentralized outlook. They have a desire to have sovereignty closer to the individual. And you shrink the size of the state, you start getting closer to that individual sovereignty. Now, we as Bitcoiners who have been around can already feel and express that individual sovereignty. You know, that that's something that I've, why I do my show and, and why I write the books as someone who's been a Bitcoiner psychologically for, you know, this is my 11th year as a professional in the industry, when this is all I think about and do, and it hasn't, the, 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 the way you're compelled to join never changes and, and participate. It's just always interesting. It's always, I didn't know that what's going on, you know? Oh my goodness. So you're always sort of interested and involved and you always sort of know which path would be good for Bitcoin and politics are a part of that right now. I don't, I don't need, if you, you know, if you saw in the book, there's no, like, if we vote for this guy, we'll get our way. There's literally any scenario is fine. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. Everything is faster. good for Bitcoin, right? Everything <laughs> is good for Bitcoin. Some is slower, some is faster. Like, like I said, the only one you really don't want is Hillary, you know, but Joe Biden, if you're an accelerationist, there isn't a better, there's no better candidate. I mean, really, like it, if you want to just get it done, right? Like now, just it's the bloody plunge, it's, plunge us into chaos because yeah, it, it, it's, it's the most disgusting. It's the most death. Right. I, I'd say, you know, depending on what uh, Trump does, you're going to get a lot of people killing themselves. Right. You're going to get mass Canadian health care distributed everywhere to people who have, you know, these the orange man's back. Unless Vivek can smooth that over. I think Kennedy is probably the best choice for the psychological state of the country in a sense, you know, not not necessarily better in a way, because. You're going to be listening to a lot of people with mental illness and confusing their political opinions for politics when it's just mental illness induced by the unbelievable toxic amounts of propaganda they consume in order to perpetuate the fiat industrial complex or the fiat component of the military industrial complex. So you can see the toxic levels of brainwashing. You can see the mental illness all around. That's to support the dollar. Trump is a bit accelerationist in that way. I think Kennedy might be able to, to rein it all in. We'll see. Uh, it's kind of a monarchist approach, which I think mis most Bitcoiners have an appetite for. We understand why monarchy is what it is, and, and it's a, a low time preference mindset for leadership. We've heard, of course, uh, Prince Philip in, in Serbia explain this many times at Bitcoin events, and you know he's got to think about his relatives. He saw what Fiat did to his family. Um, and he's learned a lot from it. And if he is compelled to be the king of Serbia for whatever reason, um, it'll be with this kind of stuff in mind, right? The, 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 the doing what's best for your society, because that's how you reward your own children by having a healthy world for them. And that's really what Kennedy is up to, right? He is a royal, he is a type of monarch, and he's out there sort of promoting um, a kind of noblesse oblige for America. And he's on all the right policies. I mean, Bitcoiners understand exactly what he's talking about with health, right? If people ate better, they would be far less easy to hypnotize with fiat. And then it would be a big problem. If, they, if we didn't have obesity as bad as it is, we would have a lot fewer brainwashed sludge people in America. And that would be a good thing, right? Well, it, it's so true. I, I put out a, I was quoting or quote noting American Hodel on, on Nostra the other day, because he was just basically saying like, we have a, we have a mental illness pandemic. Like that, that's the real yeah. pandemic is mental yeah. illness. And yeah. it was accelerated by COVID. You, I mean, you see people that are still like masking outside occasionally. If you ever find that weird subsection of Twitter, that's like, we're still masking. You're like, Dude, Oh, I go to Canada. These are the oh, dear Lord. people in the world, in the world. There's nothing like them. It, it, it's in, like, it's insane. But, you know, I, I, I quoted that saying, like, you know, it's insane to me that nowhere in the world, really, and certainly not in the U.S., do you see public health messaging being, you know what, go outside as much as you can, walk as much as you can, drink plenty of water, uh, get some exercise. But even if you can just go walk, you know what, that's a great start. And try to eat foods that are not overprocessed and packaged and served to, you know, combined up into mush and then printed into the shape that you like, uh, with the textures that trigger the right things in your brain and the right amount of, you know, crap just injected into them. You don't see that messaging at all. Certainly not in the U S and really, I mean, the food in Europe is, is marginally better. Like you can see that when you spend a little Getting bit of bad, 
Quickly. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, fiat ha- is infecting it, despite long, uh, long-standing cultural norms. Sadly, but at least you can still get pretty decent bread at most corner bakeries in most towns in Europe, which is great. But in America, like you don't see that messaging. What did you see the messaging during COVID? It was, uh, we're going to close down the parks. We're going to close down the gyms. So okay, you're closing down the places where people can. And there was no evidence to support that. And not not even then. Not, no one was making it. It was just, it was optics, right? It was optics. It was, well. I think worse. I mean, I, you know, I think it had a lot. I think it was everything to do with the election. And I'm it, stuck on that, you know. It, it was, but either way, it was just, and I'm inclined to agree with you, but it was, it was just insanity. And that level of propaganda just set off so many people that were already near the breaking point. And many of them have not come back from that. And, okay, what do you, how do you go forward from that when you're dealing with a, you know, like, well, you start with, you know, like, like clean, clean body, clean mind, you know, health, but besides these, these Miller lattes here, you know, uh, you know, try to do like as a, as an individual, what can you do? Well, try to go outside and get some sunlight, try to take a walk, spend time with your family with your friends, uh, as much as we are both very, uh, online people, I think I speak for us both when I say, you know, we prefer the time spent in person always, you know? And, and so, but it is ultimately like people have become so addicted to the actual consumption of the propaganda itself, because it's this self-affirming propaganda that makes them think, ah, my neuroses is actually warranted and okay. And, and, and why doesn't everyone, why isn't everyone else freaking out about this? And that's probably going to get worse before it gets better. Sadly, like there it's, it's going to reach a true breaking point. Like you, you saw it during Trump's election uh, in 2016, like people started to really lose it, you know? And again, I'm no fan of no, like I'm not a, a Trump fan here, but I also did not lose my shit and deteriorate into a subhuman because I thought orange man bad. So, and I don't know, it's, I think it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. This is not something, it's not a light switch, but it's something we can hopefully, again, through some of that super prompting that you talked about, start to show people like I, I'm all about the, the satirical approach, the absurdist approach. Just start asking the question of like, Every time Elizabeth Warren posts anything or, or Joe Biden posts anything about spending on anything, you say, well, well, we don't need taxes for this because we just we can just print the money, guys. It, it, you just basically you take the MMT approach like you just literally become an. Yeah, I've, I've MMT is great. Do it. Please yes. go. Debt doesn't matter. <laughs> Create oh. a government, you know, government yeah. deficit is private yeah. sector surplus, guys. It I makes it. perfect sense. Don't think about it too much. Just print the money and and. Let's, let's take this fucking train into the station, you know, but yeah, love MMT. I'm a huge MMT fan for anyone yes. listening. Yeah. I it's don't know great. anything about it. I don't care. All I know uh, is they're going to print like hell and I love it. Go. Yeah. Go. It, do it. No, the, the big thing with MMT is like that they all, you know, Stephanie Kelton's whole thing. One of the big, uh, you know, messiahs of MMT is like that government deficit is a private sector surplus. Like that's how you boost the private sector is by the government spending. It's like, it's this, like this insane. And I'm, and I'm being reductionist here. I'm sure I should read her full book, not just, uh, you know, spark notes versions of it. So that I can truly, uh, sing MMT's praises, but it's this like absurdist notion that you need the government to spend money created out of thin air to create value. When in fact that creates no value that just like subsidies are an absurdity to me. Subsidies are market distortions. And anytime I see like any sort of industry being subsidized, it's like, well, like how did we get so much fiat food? Well, because we subsidized the fuck out of the corn industry under Nixon. And we got shocker way too much fucking corn. And then we got to figure out what to do with that corn. So let's create some industrial lubricants that we then turn into actually human food lubricants. And wow, obesity starts to take off around that time too. Who could have, so it's like these, again, the hubris of people thinking that they know better than the free market is well, I, what so much of it comes down to. Especially, you know, that, that's why, I, again, I always sort of come back to COVID being a good thing for that because 
Now it's bad for the people who got kind of left behind because humanity really forked. I didn't see it coming. Again, I, I said earlier, I think we could save everyone with Bitcoin today, you know, all the plebs in the world. But then I saw COVID and I went, this is not going to work. <laughs> and they're just, it's not going to work because not only did they fork. Now, you, you just had your first kid. I had kids just before COVID. I had one in 2017 and one in 2019. But it was fine for me. Like, I wasn't following any of this stuff. I was outside. We were in parks. When New York became insufferable by the summer... We were gone. I mean, never to come back. I, I could tell it was going to be a hellhole. I came and didn't manage any of COVID risks. I didn't manage COVID risks. I went to like where it was sunny and where they couldn't lock me down and and lived my life. But what I've seen, and it's with kids, you can really see it because these are now, they're not the same species. Like these kids, compared to my kids who have grown up outside on a farm and in the Caribbean are outdoor psychopaths you know what i mean like they're so healthy and all they eat is you know grass-fed beef and raw milk and so you can imagine these are the happiest full of energy kids you can ever come across like when i see them with friends they knew in new york when they were born or anywhere we're not in the same planet of energy of happiness of what kids ought to do and I don't think there's any way getting it back. My, my, you know, if you want to look at the sovereign individual thesis and that they say there will be these mythological superhumans, that's what we got going on here. I mean, like it's not, it's not even in the same planets. It's not even in the same planets. And when you look at, you know, El Salvador, for example, the only this is one of the most effective orange pilling things out there when you're talking about COVID is this diet and the prescriptive health stuff and the in incentives. Only El Salvador said, go outside and get exercise. Only, only Bukele, right? Now, again, I'm not trying to say this leader is going to deliver us or not. It's just useful for our Bitcoin contrast. And again, I, I love to use contrast to explain Bitcoin because it's much better than explaining Bitcoin is better because you just say, well, this was what they said. They said, lock up, get a bunch of needles and don't see the sun. All he said was eat well, exercise, and and most people understood that was better. And if you can't understand that's better, you have separate problems. But you know, it was it's an effective orange pilling thing more than Bukele bought a bunch of Bitcoin actually, right? Now that that he is a Bitcoiner, when you say that after, starts to get people's mind going, right? That's one of those things where oh, what? Wait a minute, right? Wait a minute. And so it's it's a really effective tool and and you know, the, the, the psychology of folks who've embraced that low time preference thing in Bitcoin look 20 years younger now. I mean, the, 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 when you go to a, you know, here's another, I guess, indicator. So as someone who helped create the Coindesk show and consensus, and it grew into something you know, very big and, and great, I, I like a lot of it. I handle all the Bitcoin content there. But I've said this, and I, I don't want to sound like an asshole when I say it, but it's the truth. Right. As someone who who is very involved in the Bitcoin magazine planning, you just the looks alone of the Bitcoin crowd at the Bitcoin event versus the other crowd. We're we're not dealing with the same people here. Right? Like I'm not saying everyone's beautiful in Bitcoin, but it is a pleasant looking crowd. Right. The other one. Now again, I'm not. I don't want to fat shame anyone. That that's not what I'm trying to say. Right. No one chooses to be unhealthy. Um, they're hypnotized into it. I'm totally there. I'm totally there. But what I saw, and I didn't, that wasn't obvious before COVID. As someone who went, I went to every ETH event in the world because we were covering it. I was stealing ideas and things like that. So I'd been to the old ones like ETH, you know, the original ETH event and ETH2 and ETH3 and blah, blah, blah. And so th they were very similar people. You couldn't really tell the difference between 2015 and Bitcoiners had their own fucked up problems. But after 2020, what I saw was, you know, I, I don't want to put a name out there, but, you know, one, he can handle it. Take Jameson, for example, right? His physical health, how much better Jameson Lop got after the pandemic in 2020 is indicative of many Bitcoiners. Many Bitcoiners realized that the health thing was super important. And so what you see there is really what we're after. This is a root key access issue, right? When When you run on a... A Bitcoin psychological engine, your wants and fears become a little more easily perceived 
through Bitcoin and you're able to manage your health outcomes a lot better than you would in under fiat. And that's the contrast I like. Now, it's not totally true what I said. There are plenty of beautiful people that go to ETH events or whatever. But what I'm saying, you just look at an aggregate, right? You just look at the lineup of people getting a coffee and you're like, yikes, you know? <laughs> Whereas if I go to the Bitcoin show, it's like, wow, you know, look at all these beautiful people. I love it, right? Now, again, I'm not trying to be a dick and an asshole about looks, and it's not that important. And again, I'm I'm 100% not a fat shamer. Um, I want everyone to be healthy. I think everyone can. No one, you know, I'm lucky. I'm not addicted to food or alcohol. I have other addictions. Every Addiction is the operating system, right? It's good to be addicted to healthy things like Bitcoin and stacking sats. That's a great addiction to have. Cultivate the stack sacking addiction or the sat stacking addiction. <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're, we are, we are uh, programmed to be addicted to stuff. That's it. That, there's no avoiding it, right? We'll always have our addictions. We'll always create a dopamine release system. We'll always want that, that confirmation and that boost um, the problem with fiat is that it's it's running people and their systems down. It's 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 too quick. It's too short term, and it is creating these actual easily tricked, easily hypnotized zombies. But that's the good news. If you're a bitcoiner, it's also easy to trick them. Right? It's yeah. not like they're out there, uh, you know, lighting the world on fire. You just got to break through their and you do it very well with your New York Times articles about you know that that's exactly the right. Uh, aesthetic here right it's like cancel the new york times for printing on paper they're just the worst for the environment they, they really and, and i believe your thing it's, it's why true. would you kill trees to <laughs> print newspapers trees? in a digital age it's, it's insane don't insane. they care about the planet i just no. don't understand it they, <laughs> why why didn't they turn off their physical printing presses yesterday they and got you know, new I, ones just a few years ago dude i was in new york when jesus they got the new ones. christ they had a, big pay, had a big spread welcome to the new world of the new york times we got new printers and they tried to push that on everyone obviously i do not read the new york times and never have it's I, i've known it was brainwashing for quite a while but um I, I bring i bring stickers with me my uh stop the presses stickers that i had a bunch of made and whenever i'm in airports and i because that's the only place i see physical new york times you know it's like the only place i see cnn on the tv as sure, well I'm, right. I'm pretty sure that's all of cnn's viewership is in airports that's it. uh that's but it. that's beside the point but I, i'll always slap a couple uh stop the presses you know uh, new, new york times up stickers on the physical yeah. new york times when i do see them just so that maybe i awaken a few more people to the fact that Killing trees to print a newspaper full of propaganda is insane. Put your propaganda online, only online, like everyone else. I mean, come on, people. We've got a planet we're trying to steward here. This is ridiculous. Yeah. No, it's so true. I think that's great. And that's exactly the type of culture jamming that I think we need to embrace in this cycle. Because, again, we're not the, the people who found Bitcoin early, they're the outliers. They're not, you can't make. You can't take them as the model and say, we're just going to do this everywhere, right? It, it's like expecting there to be a bunch of founding fathers from the Constitution just lying around America at any time. It's not, it's not true, right? Yeah. There was only one Andreas Antonopoulos. There's only been one Francis Pouliot. There's only a few of these people. And when you see the way they are and the way they interact with the world, that's not replicatable. We got to find other ways. And it's not going to be because, oh, are you interested in Austrian school economics? If you just read, you know, this pile of fucking books, you'll you'll get it right now. I, I, I'm not trying to stop anyone from writing a Bitcoin book. God knows I love writing Bitcoin books, but I'm not going to be there doing the nag thing. Like if you were just smarter and knew about economic history, you'd be a Bitcoiner. That's just not true. That was true in 2015. You could reach people that way. Um, we are we are far beyond that world now. You know, I actually use the human capital migrations into Bitcoin from professional circles as a predictive frame. So you you can actually look at it as like sediment, right? The the original ones were the mailing list. The political people from the Ron Paul thing happened right after, and you saw real professionals giving up on politics, saying this isn't going to work. Once you saw Bitcoin, you realized there was no more. You, you couldn't support a party and expect the kind of change Bitcoin was offering. It was all band-aids. It was all lipstick on a pig. And so if you understood it back then, you realized and you took that leap of faith with Bitcoin, you said, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go in this direction. You know, th th those people are rare. You, 
you, you could see it, the political people. The next one were not sentimental. The Wall Street people who came, right, they understood what 08 did. It made Wall Street a porno. It made it a no-risk porno. It's whacking off. And some people want to fuck for real. The only fucking will do, right? People who really like risk, like an Arthur Hayes kind of guy, right, who ended up creating BitMEX, this guy loved real risk, the real thing. You can lose everything. So he went out and made BitMEX in Hong Kong where it was total cowboy. And this was exactly what it sounds like. It was fucking for real. You could die. You could get AIDS. You could, right? You could fucking get syphilis. Like it was a disaster if it went wrong. But if you want to fuck, porno won't do. It'll never do. And so we already in 2013 and 2014 were attracting real Wall Street traders, the only ones that were left in the world. Not the ones who were whacking off to porno, but the people who loved it. So that was another thing, right? Then we saw the Pepe start after and the artists came into Bitcoin. And you had these sort of sedimentary layers that that entered the conversation. What we're getting now are these Wall Street people and the energy folks. And I do believe that's the path for us, right? As, as much as I love the, the plebs of the world who are Bitcoiners, but all the other NPCs, uh, we can't contort everything we have just so that we knock fiat out with the right style we got to knock it out whatever way we can and if that involves all this crazy shit then that's what we got to do and so and by crazy shit i mean you know embracing these the the the, the failure of fiat basically um but what we can go through as fiat fails is the de-risking of the wealthy people and the energy companies because you know un unlike fiat Bitcoiners don't treat energy as like some input that academics and journalists and economists can all talk about and put it in the New York Times. Energy is the economy. It's it's not uh, an indicator on the GDP. It is the fucking GDP. Whatever else happens after it doesn't matter as far as I'm concerned. We only need one market to trade all the time with real price discovery, and that's energy denominated in Bitcoin. If energy is measured in Bitcoin, if the market for oil makes sense to the world in Bitcoin, if that is the reference in the same way that water was used to create the metric system, right? That's all the metric system is. It's okay. It, it, these are the properties. It boils here and freezes there. We'll make that zero and we'll make that a hundred and everything else comes to that. Kilometers, meters, everything came out of that. You know, Bitcoin doesn't have to be in every plebs wallet for us to win the revolution. It only has to be in the wallet or in the psychology of the richest people in the world who want to preserve their wealth and not get and want to be de-risked from what they see as sovereign failure in America. And the energy companies, why the fuck? If it doesn't make economic sense to own the war machine anymore, which is what ha happened, right? The energy companies own the war machine. It's theirs. They tell us what to do. You can say whatever you want about Ukraine and the Nord Stream, I don't care about any of the propaganda stories. The truth of the matter is American energy companies backstopped it. Whoever did it, they said, we can, you're not going to freeze to death Europe. We have the energy. And so it was our call, right? American energy did it. I don't care who hired the fucking diver and planted the bomb. It was American energy who said, makes sense to us. We're going to take Russia's market share. And maybe if we win this, we'll get their actual resources. That's all good, right? So the, the, the energy companies tell the war machine where to go, and they listen. Now, the reality of war and the, the costs of violence, exactly as the sovereign individual predicted, is changing. And the Houthis are holding off the American aircraft carriers with $25 drones, have shown and proven, and the energy companies are going to understand, that their old way and the usefulness of the U.S. war machine is, is gone, and so they need another way to stay ahead. And the only way they can come to is energy finance. That's what it's going to be. How do you finance energy? How do you build the new energy systems? And it's not going to be from, oh, the government built a nuclear reactor. <laughs> it's not that they're too stupid. So the best way is for them to build it. And the only way they're going to be able to build it is by having a uh, real price discovery and a real financial asset that allows the complex players to come together and coordinate this. So I do believe America is going to go energy abundance like we've never seen. I mean, America is about to become just already a superpower in energy. But when we, we don't get confused and sidetracked by all these foreign energy sources around the world that we never needed, that we're all just bonus, that we're all just scooped up in our unbelievable and insatiable appetite, not to innovate, but to just take what others had. 
um, because it was the cheapest and most direct way. I mean, we we as Bitcoiners have to align with this type of enemy. We do. The energy system that provided all of this stuff to the world in, in the form of direction to the war machine, we have to literally convert them and the evil ones and the good ones and whoever else is around. But we will. And, and that's the path I think we're going to take. And that's why Texas is so important in this election where they have a whole bunch of stuff about Texas in particular in the book, even though they're not involved in the federal thing, you know, what Abbott does and what Texas does. We'll provide, again, that contrast for us to understand federal overreach and, and what we did wrong in America and why we shouldn't have a federal government that runs this huge war machine. State militias are probably enough, right? So, uh, three things. First thing, yeah. uh, I read in the New York Times that Russia blew up the pipeline. Uh, is that is that <laughs> not course. true? <laughs> of course they blew up their own yeah, pipeline. Why wouldn't yeah. they blow up their own resource? Because I love you know what their excuse was too was the best. It was... Um, there, this was Moscow time for a long time. It was try to say it straight. It was because we, we, we have the segment, we call it Moscow time, of course, based on the fake news, losing their mind about Jack Dorsey when he came uh, in. His block uh, clock. Yeah. In sats clock. per yeah. dollar. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's the hallucination, right? Because the guy convinced himself that it was Moscow code. That's where the Moscow time thing comes from. It's Moscow time. So now we use it to show this hallucinatory effect. This is what they hallucinated with the Nord Stream thing, that it because Putin was his reputation about paying his bills on time was a thing. <laughs> Blow it up. <laughs> yes, it, it's such an insane. Like it's insane that that I don't know what you want to call. I was going to call them like legacy they're, they're, they're not media they're they're propaganda and like it's just propaganda. to a certain extent everything is propaganda of some sort yes you could make that kind of argument as well but this is different this but is, th th this, these is, are this is yeah this these is just hosts. absurd like and yeah. nobody who like if you read that headline you're like well i guess i guess vladimir putin did blow up his own pipeline like then fuck like we may never reach you but we certainly won't reach you for another I don't know, another few years at least but um Second thing was, I think you're exactly right with Texas. Texas, the Bitcoin mining expansion and explosion that you're seeing there, and the Texas grid's ongoing stability and ability to react to... I love Pierre uh, Richard's tweets when, when he'll be like, well, you know, prices spiked due to sunset. Um, and it's like, you know, which is just... Again, hilarious. Like, well, the sun went down, so of course prices had to go up, you know, right when everybody needs more. But Texas, they're, you know, all the these legacy media outlets for a few years were really like bashing ERCOT, bashing the Texas grid. Oh, you know, they can't manage it. And then, you know, Greenpeace was trying to blame some of that on Bitcoiners. Oh, they're creating all this instability. And, but now you see how well it's working and how Texas electricity prices are like some of the cheapest in the world. Like the, the, the it's self evident, right? You can just look at it, and as you said, you can contrast it with anywhere else, and that's a very easy comparison to make. the The one thing that I wanted to expand on um, a little bit was you you said earlier, and I think this is something that perhaps uh, a lot of Bitcoiners may take issue with, which is why I, I want to expand that in a little. But that you need to focus on the people who have the most wealth, basically grokking Bitcoin first like they're going to be the needle movers and some people may say you know i'm going to i'm going to play both sides here on the one side well that's ridiculous bitcoin should be to enfranchise the disenfranchised to uh, lift up the lowest among us you know and the other side of that is to say well what matters most is the most highly converting the most highly productive people and with you know granted fiat wealth is an imperfect measure of one's productivity and one's pot potential productivity, because again, those closest to the creation of new money derive the greatest benefit from it, right? You know, old old Richard Cantillon uh, taught us that well. But can you expand on what your position on that is a little bit? Just kind of why you've you've arrived at that? Just because again, I think some people may pick up on that and say, "Well, what do you mean?" You know, I, I don't mean we we need to prioritize bootlicking Wall Street people. So that, that <laughs> that's not like, "Oh, you're from Wall Street and you're rich. We love it." Like that's not what I mean. Yeah. Right. What I mean is there is a ma when they people talk about the wealth transfer going on or that the, the generational wealth transfer. Now, 
it's not generationally, really. It's from NPCs to Bitcoiners. And however we manage that is fine with me because it's a mad rush. Now, I, I agree with the Bitcoiners that in 100 years, you sell a JPEG and you launch a shitcoin, you'll probably be killed on the spot and it won't, you won't need a trial because everyone's time preference will be so low that we'll all have time to contemplate it and they'll be, well, he's a scammer. How did you know? And everyone will be so trustworthy because, you know, the incentives are better and we can trust each other a little better. And, and they'll say, well, he's a scammer. So we had to kill him, right? But we're nowhere near that yet. <laughs> nowhere near that, right? So I agree with the toxic maximalists about all of that stuff, right? It's all dumb, JPEGs and blah, 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 blah. But we are in this weird middle period with all this money out there. And it's going to be converted through the Wall Street apparatus. So we have to win this fight. It's, it's like a major battleground. I don't know if it has to be the number one thing. I, I hope that people down in wherever, South America, Argent, all these Argentinian people. But the truth is they've had, what are we at, 15 years ahead of the markets. We've told them for 15 years this is coming. We can't slow it down just to get a few people on. That's not the kind of rocket we're building here, right? We, we sent this Bitcoin thing into orbit to get away from the earthly forces of gravity. We wanted exit velocity, right? We had to get into space before they could take us apart. And there's only a few ways to do that, right? This is a literal engineering fight. And when you look at this battlefront and what we can win, just through shit talking and memes and all this shit, right? We got to get that. We got to win that prize. Just like energy. We need, we don't need every energy company holding Bitcoin in the balance sheet. What we need them to do is not recognize the dollar as useful for measuring the markets because it's for food stamps. And what we need is bricks to also fail because it is also a shit coin, right? No one's going to trust it. So in the end, what are they going to reference for energy prices? How are they going to measure the price of West Texas crude versus Brent versus whatever? You win that fight, you start winning the psychological war that we're in, right? Now, World War III is psychological and economic. I think they're very similar. Economics are a form of psychology. Uh, but let's just pull them apart for a second. Go back to the economics part. It's just the reality. The vast amount of wealth that's held is held by boomers who are dying. Now, I think an angel gets their wings when I see a boomer signing up for a collateralized loan on some stupid fucking platform, staking Solana and all this shit. And I think every Bitcoiner should sit there and go, this is hilarious. I can sell this fucking moron a goddamn JPEG and turn it into Bitcoin? Are you fucking serious? Now I get it. It puts the fees up high and all that, right? That's the problem. You know, you don't, again, you want the Argentinian to not have to pay, uh, you know, too many sats for a, a, a transaction, but it, it's just, it, it's not where the fight is. The energy is on Wall Street. It is with the ETF. It is with this huge um, breakdown of what Wall Street was. Right. That, that's the real change here. We want to change Wall Street. We want to wipe it out. Right. The, the best way to wipe out Wall Street is actually to make Ethereum a bigger scam. It's not big enough. It's got to be so big that everyone in Wall Street trades whatever it is for something on ETH. And then in the end, it's like, yeah, but we can roll it back, motherfuckers. <laughs> and then they go, oh, what? And then it's all gone. Right. And then it's all gone because we're not here to tweak Wall Street. That's not the game. The game to go after these wealthy people is to destroy it, destroy it. So when I say prioritize it, it's not to make sure. Now, I, I don't, if someone makes money off this and they get a bunch of Bitcoin, I don't care. I mean, this is, this is war. It's war, right? And I'm not going to sit here like some people and say, you know, oh, you're, you're a murderer in a war. <laughs> There's no murdering in war. There's no such thing. You kill people, right? This is death. So... Now, this is not that kind of war. This is an economic war, right? And if we wipe out the morons on Wall Street who don't think they're hypnotized, who really believe their wants and fears are their own, they, they think they're their own, right? They're not. not. Neither are ours, right? We're all sort of NPCs, all of us, <laughs> even the Bitcoiners, right? So we can all be prompt engineered is what I mean, right? It, it, like, like that... To me, that's what Donald Trump is. He's the greatest prompt engineer we've ever seen. I mean, he's a prompt engineer. That's what he does. And, and, and everyone's susceptible to it. He just goes in and, you know, prompt and then bang, people do shit, right? And so 
prompt engineering is what the fiat system does. They've understood prompt engineering well, long before we had AI. They understood how to nudge people and how to pre-suade, right, to set something up so that your own cognitive solution to a threat that's been given to you and, and put in front of your, your line of sight, it's a magic trick. It's exactly that. Look at this, look at this, boom, here's the solution, which comes to yourself, right? You, you come up with the idea to put shackles on. And so that's why I use the prompt engineering stuff in my book, because that's who we're fighting against. We're not fighting against people who had better arguments. There's no arguments here. We're not, this is not the, we're not in the field of rational humans. We're not rational. We're not rational. We teach, you know, Bitcoin, there's numbers everywhere. It has nothing to do with math. People say, oh, I love the math of Bitcoin. Yeah, it's great. It's what gives us assurance that it's true and it's the one data point. But truthfully, it is um, the, the, the psychology that it unleashes is our advantage, right? The, the confidence that um, we've got the system is what will inevitably bring us to a level of, of, of economic ability to win this fight. And that's what we have to do. It's an economic war. And we've got to be richer than them. That's it. We need the Bitcoiners, the richest, and all the people who got in early, rich. But that's not really the prize. The prize is to decimate the job of Wall Street. It's to destroy the financial engineer. And there's a few ways to do that, right? And I say deliver them all the ETH they can handle. Deliver them Solana with a bow. <laughs> this is great. Take it, guys. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. Collateralize. Go. You know, spin it. Get that Get yield. The... Get the yield. <laughs> And now there will be people who don't fall for that. There will be people who will. So again, this is my, my thesis is not to go bootlick Jamie Dimon. <laughs> Jamie Dimon, I don't give a fuck about him, right? I know what he, I've been talking to Jamie Dimon's office for years. They're not, they're liars. I, I've known it forever. It's complete and total liars, right? You know, Bitcoiners will fall for Peter Schiff too. I don't know if it's real. I don't think it is. This is a character. It's wrestling. It's wrestling. He's a heel. He had a better chance to be a heel. He played the heel. You know, it, it's not about caring what he thinks. He knew people would watch. And so he did it and it worked. Um, I don't know if that's true, but when I saw the kid come out and he was in, he was into Bitcoin, it was a wrestling script. Man, I watched enough WWE in my life. And then he had his, exactly. his AI arc, like, oh no, I'm not interested in Bitcoin anymore. Now it's, now it's AI. And, and exactly, exactly. I mean, exactly. honestly, yeah, good acting really on, good acting. from yeah, the Schiff family. Can, you got to give him respect, man. I, you can't let him trigger you. You can't get angry. Peter Schiff today said he Bitcoin uh, is dumb and he loves gold and everyone's like, Wah. oh, I, I love I, I love it because I, I like to lean into it because it's it's so absurd. It's Again, he yeah. he is unless he like I am totally misreading this. Peter Schiff is one of the greatest absurdists of our, of, of, of our present time. Like, yes, like, yes, like yes, yeah, yes. maybe maybe of all like it's yeah. incredible satire. Yeah. Because, yeah. and all you have to do is look at the fact that Peter Schiff will sell you gold in exchange for Bitcoin. Yeah. Like, like, he will literally, you can buy gold from him yeah. and pay in Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. Like, l don't look at what they say, look at what they do. Exactly. And, and exactly. it's very obvious. Yeah. He had a motherfucking ordinals collection of mm -hmm. fucking terrible JPEG art. I, you know, I right click saved a few of them just so I have them, you know, yeah. and like, like, again, try, he's trying to acquire Bitcoin very yeah. obviously. Yeah. yeah. And, but honestly, dude's a good actor and yeah. us Bitcoiners have amplified him up to a yeah. million followers. Cause you know, the majority of real gold bugs aren't on Twitter. They're in their fucking bunker already. They're like, we're, we're, we're ready, you know, yeah. but no, I, I'm glad you clarified that because. I think the clarification was very important. And again, it comes back to your kind of core thesis, which is accelerate absurdity, accelerate contrast. Mm -hmm. And I mean, what, what you're basically suggesting there is like, look, whether these very wealthy people who, who are the, you know, the fiat cantillionaires, whether they get Bitcoin or not, or get distracted by all the other peripheral shit, it's still good for Bitcoin. It, it, it's, it's ultimately still good for Bitcoin. If, if they decide, if they really end up clicking with Bitcoin, well, great. You've got somebody who has an immense amount of purchasing power who just grokked it. If they don't and they get distracted by, you know, chasing the yield, uh, also great. They get wiped out. Again, you know, everything is good for Bitcoin, right?
to me, you know, you look at the, you remember the the boxing match between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman? And if you don't know it, you know, it's the rope-a-dope thing, and it, right? So George Foreman is falling. He's a huge man. And he's sort of lumbering around the stage when Ali finally got him. And you see Ali sort of not hit him once. He's cocked and he's ready to go. And if you saw that movie, When We Were Kings, they describe that moment. Basically, Ali's thinking now that he doesn't want to be off balance when he knocks him out because it will ruin the beauty of like a, like a like a an ugly punch, you know. And that's kind of how I think about the Wall Street stuff for Bitcoiners. Like we argue about the style of knocking out fiat. No, 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 knock them the fuck out. I don't care about the fucking style. Knock them out. Like we we can't sit around here. We don't have time to say, oh well, I wish we would have had a three punch combo in the tenth minute of round you know or the 10th round you know third minute like dramatic or something no just knock the fucker out it doesn't matter how we'll clean up the mess after and bitcoin will be supreme and if there's the worst cantillionaire who made bitcoin and got out what are we supposed to do about that i mean really are we in a world where we're going to be policing who has bitcoin of course not of course not that's, that's the last thing we want to do i don't care who gets it i don't care and and if i see wall street going to generate again because that's what it is it's a degenerate shithole if you're going to come there in a degenerate shithole and think you're going to nag people into being healthier and exercising it's not going to work you need to do this you need to rug pull them punch them in the face sell them eth tell them what you did on the other end with it and laugh at them when they're poor that's it <laughs> like that's it you know that's it that's that's the game you know I, honestly i i I like the perspective very much, you know, it, and yeah. it, it really does get back to the, the whole, like, everything is good for Bitcoin. Yeah. Like, and I think a lot of, uh, you know, I, I, I have empathy for people who still don't grok Bitcoin because it took me a long time to grok it. I, I heard about it during the, the Silk Road days from a buddy who was like, hey, I'm ordering something uh, off the Silk Road. And you, have you heard of this Bitcoin thing? I like need to get some to, to pay to pay this guy. I'm like, dude, I don't care about your nerd shit. Like, you know, whatever, you know, so ignored, right? Back to back to fiat life for a couple of years, 2017 bull run hits. Huh, Bitcoins. Now that thing that my buddy told me about, now that's like in the news. Huh, okay, well, let me just see what's going on here. Oh. I can't afford a full Bitcoin. Let me just buy one of these Litecoins uh, because, you know, I, I, I can't afford a full Bitcoin. Again, fucking idiot, right? Always been there. Yep. And, and then finally 2020 rolls around and I see that the government is just start. It's like they are starting to just create money out of nothing. And I was really paying attention at this point. And then I was like, well, hold on a second. This doesn't make any, you know, where the fuck does the money come from? How, they're about to start sending out stimulus checks in a, in a, in a month. What from like, from where, like what, what, where is it coming from? That it like, doesn't make any sense. And that's when I started like really going deep, but in, you know, it, it takes people sometimes a few, a few nudges and then one big knock on the head before they finally like, and that was me. So again, like I have I have so much empathy for people who have heard about Bitcoin, heard about Bitcoin. Now, it's also a thing where it's like, well, there are some people I have no empathy for because, you know, they've heard about it, heard about it, been in the right circles to actually understand it, been exposed to it countless times, not just like once every couple of years. And they're still just so, they have that sunk cost bias where they're so deep in their hole, they're never going to get out. And, and, them Not it's like bad. okay you know Here, here's another frame for you if you want to yeah. help understand and bridge the gap to those people because i i you know look if you come from the early days there wasn't as much of a distinction between shit coiners and bitcoiners yet right they, they just didn't need to be yeah but i've never i've never changed my tune from back then and it's the following you know bitcoin all the other cryptos have the same consumer tech mindset in place, right? Where it's like newer iPhone 11, 12, 13, Super Nintendo, Nintendo 64, right? Bitcoin, of course, was unique. Now we've been trained to understand technology in this way, right? We've been trained to understand consumer technology. Bitcoin came around 
and it inverses that it's the oldest it's the slowest it's this and that but that's important if you're doing something like money where credibility becomes the number one factor not just is it we're not trying to beat visa here and you know transactions per minute that's the problem of the smart high iq people who have had access to bitcoin for years they still haven't broken the mold on the consumer mindset the consumer tech mindset because everything around you in fiat would hypnotize you into believing that's just reality that newer is better but we of course understood and that that's a very revolutionary act to understand the Lindy effect piece to this, that, that, that it's every day that Bitcoin has survived. It's the length of time it's been alive that's, that, that's valuable. And that's very hard for some people to grok because, again, we're not dealing with an information or IQ problem. What we're dealing with is hypnotism. What we're dealing with is black magic, a form of black magic that is altering people's view of reality now, it might have been good. It might have been close enough to reality 80 years ago that you could have one job and raise a family on it, right? You didn't have to have all of these compromises and and you didn't have to, um, you know, sort of, uh, I, what's the word? It's not eat crow, but you didn't have to, you didn't. You didn't have to put water in your wine to that extent and say, oh, it's great. It's still great. You didn't have to do the mental gymnastics to talk yourself into, oh, I love sitting in traffic and no one sees their kids and we are working all the time and it's just the best, right? We get two weeks vacation a year. It's awesome, right? So that that whole piece, I think anyway, is is where we can actually win and it's what a lot of these methods that I have are are about. They're about provoking these people, you know, not with an argument, but with a, a way that reverses and makes the fiat world collapse on its own weight. Because it's, it is so made up now and it's such a hallucination that it's easy to use that contrast. So that to me is, is how I try and go about doing it. You know, it's, it, it seems to work. Now you got to guide them because they'll either hate you when you do the cognitive dissonance thing. So you'll lose a lot of friends this way, right? Because they, they will hate you if you, if you, you know, I've been doing this for years. So they, they fucking hate it when people make them review. No one wants to review their whole worldview, not you and not me either, right? I don't, I don't want to hear anything about the vaccine, nothing. I don't want to change. I don't want to learn more about it and change my opinions. And I, I don't want to hear it, right? And if someone brings me information about the vaccines, I'm angry. I'm angry. Like, like, shut the fuck up, you stupid shit talking to me about fucking vaccines. Get the fuck out of here. I don't want to hear anything about it, right? Not data on any side, on any side, nothing, zero, not interested. And so the, 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 the way we can actually implement that and, and connect with these people is, you know, through, through these kinds of mimetic techniques because once they hate you or they're opened, that's when you have the chance to get into their subconscious and really just drop Bitcoin memes into that, you know, fleshy, the, the underbelly that they've exposed. And, and you can pump them right in there at that time because they don't know anything. If you can say you love having a retarded president because it's, it's amazing, right? Because it's good for your bag and the U.S. is dumb and the whole thing's going to fall. People never thought about that before. They're like, what? And it's it, like I say, I do the Ethereum thing with Bitcoiners. No, no, no. Ethereum's not a big enough scam. You're not, what are you protecting Bitcoiners from Ethereum for? What are you talking about? Let it go to the people who have no idea what's going on here. Let them buy dog shit all day long. What's the best way to make a Bitcoiner? I know what it is. The foolproof way to make a Bitcoiner is to make them lose shitcoin money. It works every time. It's the best way. There's never been a better way. There's never been a better way. Shitcoining and getting burned is the the tried and true passage of most Bitcoiners. And we should embrace people shitcoining and getting burned. It will happen eventually. Like, take me, for example, at Coindesk all those years. I worked for Kraken. I'm as inside fucking baseball as you can get with these motherfuckers, right? I got every VC begging me to be on stage. I got, and for years now. Right? I knew every secret, everything that was going to pop, every coin that was going to go to a million, all of it, right? And even I couldn't trade against these fucking people. With all the information that I have, even I would get burned in the old days, right? Because it's, it's an unwinnable game. <laughs> it's just, it's literal gambling. And indeed, you know, even, even for example, like, you know, equity and companies that are startups, it's all I have left is the Bitcoin, 
right? Everything else gets, you know, Kraken getting sued by the SEC, DCG fucking done. <laughs> See ya, all right? Uh, you know, Bitcoin Magazine gets sued by the Federal Reserve or cease and desist. They're financially fine, but it's it's like you get these enemies that that are going to come after you and you got to deal with it, you know? So uh, the best way that I've known is let them get burned, you know? <laughs> it works every time. I think it may honestly be the only foolproof way. Like, yeah. again, you very few people get smart by choice. The majority yeah. gets smart by force. And that yeah. force is usually something very unpleasant. It's mm -hmm. usually pain. Yeah. But then you get smart. Yeah. But sometimes you, you know, you need to touch, you need to get, touch the stove and realize it's hot. So yeah, you don't fucking no. touch the stove again. No, like, I don't want to leave any moral lighthouse censored. I, I don't have any problem with Maxis being to their absolute most toxic. That's, that's, that's the way the system ought to work. Some people do need to hear the extreme version, even if it's not for the world today. You know what I mean? Like, even if, even if it's not for the world today, I don't think I would be as cavalier about shipping all of Ethereum into Wall Street to destroy it had I not understood Peter Todd's breakdown of complexity theater and Francis Pouliot's way of triggering Vitalik. And like, I wouldn't have understood what was really going on. Um, you know, I've met, I've met Vitalik a million times. He's a great guy. He's super nice. Right. He's like gentle, gentle, gentle. Um, but what we, what, what they created and what they did all those years ago I understand why people hate it. It is it is something to criticize and and condemn, but that's just to be right. The game here is not to be right. The game here is hyper bitcoinization. And if people want to get confused by iPhone 12 and iPhone 13 before they understand we reverse the polarity on tech development here, then they've got to learn. And it, it sometimes it takes a punch in the face. You know, it's the Mike Tyson quote you know everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face everyone has a plan for their shit coins and their fucking 401k and their shit fiat trash tokens right they all have ideas for that money and then they get punched in the face and and so that that's a reality and again we we can't argue about the style of bitcoin winning it, it's it's a war it's a kinetic war it's a psychological and economic war it involves taking over vast resources food energy um and destroying entire industries and so it's a big war and i can't think of a better way to destroy an industry than polluting it and corrupting it to its very core by injecting so much toxic garbage into it that it can't survive you know what kind of stock picker it's already not a job you know what i mean stock picking it's already not a job so now you're gonna go be a shit coin picker all right there's a way to get rid of this there's a way to get rid of it forever and that's by allowing it all to just get way worse, right? I I pray for ETH at whatever thousands of dollars eclipsing Wall Street. It'll be the funniest thing you ever see when it all comes down because it's bullshit. It's a proof of stake shitcoin scam. And the best thing we can do with it is drive it right into Wall Street. Let all these people, oh, I did the technical analysis on Ethereum. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Great. <laughs> I love it, man. Well, you know, that's, that is honestly, I think, uh, about as perfect a note to wrap up on as we could have. Um, let's, let's, let's drive Ethereum right into the belly of Wall Street. So yeah, that's man, the only surefire way to bring it down. Push the yeah. Solana, Oh, God. Yeah. What are the new one? You got to always cycle up, whatever the new yep. one is. You got to just cycle it, up. It'll be down up, for maintenance for a little while, but, you know, just uh, once, that's once fine. it's back up, you know, yeah. It's so good. Well, hey, uh, where uh, any any place you want to uh, send people, I'll, I'll link. Uh, I'll, sure, I'll link yeah. In the I, show notes, um, yeah, I do the breakup every day. You can catch that on YouTube. You can catch that on Rumble. You can catch that on the Bitcoin Magazine Rumble channel. Um, I think it's along with Simply Bitcoin, the two most watched daily shows in the industry. It's every day, eight a.m. Eastern time. Um, and then I publish my books at nolanbowerly.com. So you can find the Bitcoiner's Guide to NPC Management, the Bitcoiner's Guide to the U.S. 2024 elections. They're both there, free downloads. Uh, I am also in the Bitcoin sci-fi game, and I've got a couple of Bitcoin sci-fi novels. One will be coming out soon called Blue Moon Orange Coin. Very fun. Ooh. Very fun. 
I like it. Oh, I can't wait to check it out, man. Yeah. Uh, I got to say, thank you so much for, for coming on here today. Bitcoin is scarce, but Bitcoin podcasts are abundant. So thank you for sharing your scarce time to so come on hey, another thanks. fucking Bitcoin podcast. No, this was a, this was a real treat for me. Yours is one of the podcasts I like. So there you go. Well, now I'm going to be blushing as we go off camera here. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks so much. Peace, man. And that's a wrap on this Bitcoin Talk episode of The Bitcoin Podcast. If you are a Bitcoin-only company interested in sponsoring another fucking Bitcoin podcast, head to bitcoinpodcast.net or hit me up on social media. On Noster, head to primal.net slash walker. And on Twitter, search for at Walker America or at Titcoin Podcast. You can also watch the video version of this show on X or on YouTube by going to youtube.com slash at Walker America or rumble by searching for at Walker America. Bitcoin is scarce. There will only ever be 21 million, but Bitcoin podcasts are abundant. So thank you for spending your scarce time to listen to another fucking Bitcoin podcast. Until next time, stay free. <laughs>